Hello and welcome to my podcast. I'm your host Larry Liu and today uh, this is going to be uh, the first YouTube and video based podcast. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to talk about the uh, coronavirus, uh, which is a very serious concern and I'm going to take a historical perspective uh, to understand that phenomenon. So as the coronavirus spreads in the US, and all over the world, we are reminded of the perennial war between uh, human and nature. Nature gave us the space to thrive and grow as a species. Planet Earth has just the right amount of oxygen and nitrogen to allow animal species, including humans, to breathe, whereby periods of increased oxygen supply result in bigger species like dinosaurs. Dinosaurs died out in part because the reduction in oxygen made their survival impossible. Nature also offers all of the things we need to survive, including food and oil. Oil is the accumulated ancient remains of dead species that are stored in liquid form. When humans began to use coal in 4000 BC, it was a major intervention into nature. Although it would take thousands of years, with the Industrial Revolution until the impact on nature became significant enough to result in rising temperature and climate change. We are living with those effects today. Human-nature relations are not entirely harmonious. Pestilence in the form of virus and bacteria have been around long before we humans existed. A virus can mutate and infect host species, which usually are animals. Humans have used domesticated animals for thousands of years, and hanging around infected domesticated animals, uh, as well as encountering uh, wild animals, can result in disease transmission and death. Agriculture, urbanization, and globalization, things that we take for granted, favor the transmission of disease as the former increase the total population and the second increases density and la latter moves these people into natural spaces and putting them into contact with wild animals that were previously undiscovered by humans. Cold and flu have been quite common and recur every year, which results in the death of tens of thousands of people in the U.S. alone. The plague is still raging in countries like Madagascar, while Ebola was a big problem in West Africa. Pandemics have been quite common, although the last major pandemic affecting the world has been the Spanish flu between 1918 and 1920 which killed between 50 and 100 million people. Therefore, the current coronavirus comes as a substantial shock to many societies. I suspect there are not too many people alive today who can still remember the Spanish flu. An important sociological takeaway from the history of pandemics is that it explains temporary social breakdown but also focuses the human mind to address this problem as a common challenge. So I discuss briefly the three major pandemics, including the Black Death or the Plague from 1346 to 1353, and the Spanish Flu, uh, which raged from 1918 to 1920, as pointed out. Uh, SARS in 2003... Uh, before turning to the evolution of the current COVID-19, the coronavirus. The Black Death or the bubonic plague was caused by Yersinia pestis, which was carried by fleas uh, on ground rodents like marmots in Central and Western Asia. The warming of the climate in Asia pushed the rodents from dry grassland to more human-populated areas. So even if humans are not seeking out uh, those wild species, they are going to seek us out. The first documented case of the plague occurred in 1338 in Kyrgyzstan, 
uh, from which it spread to China and India, where a further outbreak was documented. In the 1330s to 1340s, 25 million people in Asia died as a result of the plague. By the autumn of 1347, the plague reached the Middle East via Alexandria, Egypt. It traveled to Gaza, Lebanon, Syria, Israel, Palestine, and then Arabia, and the rest of North Africa. The disease reached Mecca in 1349, and Muslim religious scholars thought that the plague was a sign of martyrdom and mercy uh, from God, and they told believers that they would reach paradise upon death, thus being very skeptical of treating the disease with medicine. But there also were other doctors um, in the region who applied very strict preventative measures and treatments as far as they were feasible. In October of 1347, the plague reached Europe via Sicily. Genoese traders at the port of Kaffa in Crimea contracted the disease as the invading Mongol army threw corpses of infected individuals over the walls uh, of Kaffa. The fleeing Genoese traders took the disease back to Italy. The plague reached Genoa and Venice in January of 1348, and from there it was transmitted to Marseille in France. From there it went to Spain, Portugal, UK, Germany, and the north of Scandinavia. The main symptoms of the plague was the swelling of lymph nodes on the groin, neck, and armpits. This was followed by acute fever and vomiting of blood. Most victims die between two to seven days after contracting. Freckle-like spots and rashes were also quite common. In another common strand of the plague, breathing difficulties and pneumonia occurred. The plague recurred throughout the 14th to the 17th centuries. It wasn't until 1898 that Paul-Louis Simon found out that fleas were the carriers of the disease. By that point, another outbreak began in southern China, um, starting in 1865, which spread to India. Australia had plague outbreaks from 1900 to 1925, while San Francisco in the U.S. was struck in the first decade of 1900s, which was, I think, the only time it happened uh, in the Americas. In the last 10 years, we see outbreak, outbreaks uh, on the island of Madagascar, so it's not completely gone. The plague is still uh, with us in isolated pockets. In total, 75 to 200 million people have died of the disease, uh, primarily uh, in Eurasia. Remote populations like the Australian Aborigines and the Native Americans were not impacted by the plague, uh, but they also weren't impacted by other you know, uh, common uh, diseases like smallpox. Um, you know, when, that, when the plague struck in the f uh, 14th century, but when they were colonized by Europeans, it c was quite deleterious to these populations as they lacked exposure and hence immunity do to those diseases. In European cities, the Black Death produced a death toll of between 50 to 60 percent, whereby monks, nuns, and priests were especially hard hit because they uh, cared for these um, patients. The social effects of the plague were profound. Because comparatively more lower class individuals, you know, laborers and peasants, died of the disease, Wages soared as labor shortages forced landowners to pay high wages to laborers and extract less rent on their peasants. Pro poor social changes and the rise of free farm laborers seeking the highest wage became important in the later period in Western Europe, which favored the market economy and the rise of the bourgeoisie in large cities. Survivors of the plague inherited the unclaimed land. In contrast, in Eastern Europe, the plague was equally devastating to the population, but landlords uh, kept a tight leash on the subordinate peasantry, hence um, Russia didn't abolish uh, serfdom until 1861. 
The environmental effects of the 14th century plague was quite positive, as reduced human population meant less land use and reforestation, which actually cooled the climate. The inverse relationship between population numbers and a favorable climate is repeated today after over 200 years of industrialization and rapid population growth. The spread of the disease has been favored by poverty as these conditions are associated with the presence of lice, unsanitary drinking water, and generally poor sanitation. Children and people with a weak immune system are especially vulnerable to the disease. Even as only select poor countries are prone to be affected by the plague and the vaccines have been developed to cure it, the plague bacterium could develop drug resistance over time, in which case a broader human population would be exposed to the plague. So now we turn to the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu was the next largest epidemic which killed between 50 and 100 million people, uh, killing 2.5% of those infected, which is similar in range to what experts think to coronavirus causes, somewhere between 0.5 and 3.5%. Common symptoms include fever, nausea, aches, and diarrhea. Severe cases involved hemorrhage and pneumonia, which became a common cause of death. The Spanish flu was carried by birds who then infected humans. A later strain affected swine, hence um, the 2009 swine flu, H1N1. Spanish flu is somewhat of a misnomer because even though it raged in Spain as well as in many other parts of the world, it was the free press reporting on it that provided an extensive record of how the disease impacted the population. What was especially devastating with the Spanish flu was that contrary to normal flus which harm small children and old people, it killed many young adults at the prime of their health because the relatively stronger immune system produced a cytokine storm, which is an overreaction of the immune system which destroyed the patient's lungs. The Spanish flu arrived in two waves, first in the fall of 1917 and the strongest strain in the fall of 1918. There are disputes about the origin of the virus ranging from northern China, a military base in France, and Kansas in the United States. The Spanish flu was not as fatal in China as in other parts of the world, which is likely because the flu strain hit the Chinese population before it affected other areas. The Spanish flu had immensely negative impacts in Europe because the flu emerged too at the end of World War I. Pandemics are favored by high levels of population density, which was almost certainly the case in the trenches of World War I. You know, where you know you can imagine there were a lot of soldiers who were injured uh, and already malnourished and very weak. It is also favored by globalization or the movements of people across borders, which was also the case with soldiers during the war. Soldiers, as I pointed out, were weakened by malnutrition during the intense battles, which made them more vulnerable to die when they received the infection. But what made the flu pandemic worse was that the soldiers that became infected by the severe strain were carried back to the medical camps who spread the flu to all the other wounded um, via sneezing and coughing. Once these wounded returned to the home communities, they spread the disease to the civilian population. Normally during peacetime, the flu fails to be as deadly as the Spanish flu because the severe case patients stay home while mild case patients go about their day and spread the mild rather than the aggressive strain. So here variation in government policy had substantial effect on the spread of the disease, which we should learn about today. 
In Philadelphia, the city desi- decided not to cancel a war bond rally to fund the war, as hundreds of people had already been diagnosed with the flu. So the officials knew that the disease was ongoing, but didn't uh, cancel the festivities. Over 45,000 people became infected and 12,000 Philadelphians died, and the city's activities ground to a halt. In contrast, St. Louis cancelled the rally, public schools and other public venues, and the death toll was limited to only 700 throughout uh, the entire course of disease progression. A total lockdown can keep the number of infected contained, which ultimately saves lives. On the other hand, given the virulence of a virus, true protection can only occur if there is herd immunity, which is when roughly 60% of the population had contracted the virus, developed immunity for it, and no longer spread it to the rest of the population. So um, this is going to be relevant for the coronavirus, which I'm going to discuss in a moment. Aside from Europe and the US, many deaths were reported elsewhere. In Japan, 23 million people were infected, killing 390,000. In Indonesia, 1.5 million people died. In Iran, an estimated 8 to 22 percent of the population perished. In Brazil, it was 300,000. In Ghana, it was 100,000. Aside from China, one of the few light points of the pandemic was Denmark, where many people were exposed to the first wave and developed immunity when the second, more deadly strain arrived. The mortality rate in the first wave was uh, 0.02%, and the second wave it was 0.27%. More fortunately for the human race was that by November 1918, the number of deaths decreased substantially, which suggests that the more virulent strain had died out. Despite the high cost to life, the Spanish flu was a blip in overall human history compared to the effects in, in, in the plague. As technical um, improvements in agriculture and medicine facilitated the further explosion of the population, which increased um, from about 2 billion to 7.7 billion in the span of a century from 1920 to 2020. The difference between the 14th century plague and the 20th century Spanish flu is that the mortality rate was higher during the plague, even as the total number of deaths was higher in the Spanish flu. The plague tends to be more devastating in malnourished communities, which was a much more common problem prior to industrial agriculture, which actually is a positive point, which I'm going to attack later, actually. But, um... The plague killed many religious clerics, which currently, um, well, currently heavy death tolls occur among hospital and medical staff, which suggests a more scientific outlook as uh, you know society evolved. But solving one disease does not solve all other diseases, and nature keeps us working to find new means to fight new diseases. The flu can have extremely deadly mutations which are favored with more densely populated areas and globalization, including international travel via improved transportation networks. While the plague is confined to very underdeveloped countries, we have a flu season every year for most countries, whereby the peak is reached in the cold winter period when our immune system is most vulnerable. Acquiring immunity from one strain in the disease does not imply immunity from another later strain, hence we are prone to become sick every year. Over 30,000 people have died from the flu in the U.S. this season, most of which are elderly and people with pre-existing medical conditions. More damaging than the flu has been the coronavirus, of which COVID-19 is the seventh um, strain, you know, the seventh mutation of the disease. The fifth and sixth strain of the coronavirus, uh, SARS and MERS, require further elucidation uh, before we can turn to COVID-19. 
A coronavirus is a viral respiratory disease which attacks the lungs and causes flu-like symptoms, including fever, muscle pain, uh, lethargy, cough, sore throat, and shortness of breath. In extreme cases, it results in pneumonia and death. The coronavirus comes from infected uh, wild bats who come into contact with humans in wet markets and then spread the virus to humans, who can transmit the virus to other humans via respiratory droplets or uh, fomites. The first dangerous strain was uh, SARS, uh, or the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, of which there were over 8,000 cases, 774 deaths, and a 9.6% death rate. Thus, while the strain was very deadly, the prevalence of the disease was also very low. SARS emerged from cave-dwelling horseshoe bats in China's Yunnan province. China is extremely susceptible to originate coronavirus because of so-called wet markets, where bats are sold as delicacies. Bats would be stacked on top of other animals, while animals would def defecate on top of each other and easily spread the infection. In the case of SARS, the first case was reported in November 2002 when a patient from Shunde Foshan in Guangdong was treated in a hospital there in Foshan. The patient died thereafter, but the authorities did not recognize the case as, a highly, uh, as highly infectious and did not report the disease to the World Health Organization um, you know, um, until you know, February 2003. On January 31st, 2003, a super spreader, which is a sick individual who infected many others, was admitted to the Sun Yat-sen Memorial Hospital in Guangzhou, which then spread it to other hospitals. The Chinese authorities were very resistant in cooperating with global authorities to combat the disease, uh, and it wasn't until April 2003 that they let in international officials to investigate the situation. As an authoritarian society, the government did not allow for honest reporting of the disease, which resulted in the undetected spread of the disease, especially in hospital settings. The WHO was informed in February 2003 about the disease as an Italian doctor, Carlo Urbani, who worked in a Hanoi hospital in Vietnam, treated uh, Johnny Chen, an American businessman, with SARS and fell ill after visiting China. Both Urbani and Chen died, but now the international community was alerted. Hong Kong was disproportionately impacted by SARS. Mainland China reported 5,327 cases, while it was 1,755 in Hong Kong. Canada was a Western country with the largest SARS exposure, documenting 255, 251 cases, primarily from Hong Kong and mainland residents flying to Canada. Taiwan reported 346 and Singapore 238 cases. South Korea notably only had three cases, which might explain why South Korea was for a while overwhelmed by COVID-19, while Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore were quite well prepared for the current strain. By July 2003, SARS had been contained, although China still reported selected cases in December 2003 and January 2004. So in this case, all went well. What helped containment was maybe the warmer weather, although the spike in cases occurred between March and middle of May, which actually is a warming period. And that's actually the period that we're in right now, in the middle of March. More importantly, the diseases of, uh, the, uh, sorry, the deadliness of SARS with a nearly 10% case fatality meant that the highest infectiousness was for the sickest patients who could be isolated because of the severity of the symptoms. 
COVID-19, in contrast, has a fatality of between 0.5 and 3.5%, much higher than the common flu of 0.1%, but much lower than SARS, which might explain the high caseload for COVID-19, which is 150,000 as of March 14. But you know, these numbers are changing and improving, uh, sorry, increasing as we speak. Not well, improving in some in some regions. I'll get to that. Although it is still growing exponentially, there are likely millions of undetected cases as of now. So with SARS resolved, researchers still warned the public that a new strain could spread more deadly and widely. And indeed, as of now, COVID-19 killed over 5,000 people compared to 774 from SARS. So MERS... Uh, which is the Middle East Respiratory Disease, is another coronavirus that emerged in 2012 when the first case was reported in Saudi Arabia. MERS also came from Australian um, or African bats, but transmitted the disease to camels somewhere in the mid-1990s, so way earlier, before transmitting to humans by the early 2010s, so that's why it's a 2012 outbreak. Camels are delicacies in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. By 2017, there have been over 2,000 cases and 600 deaths, with a case fatality of over 30%. So it's even more deadly than SARS. MERS is unusually deadly, but the high lethality also made it unlikely to become a global pandemic because infected patients tended to have very severe symptoms which resulted in them being isolated from the wider community. There has been no vaccine for either SARS or MERS, so infected patients with severe symptoms have to be attached to ventilators to be supplied with oxygen, hoping that these patients uh, can recover over time, and some unfortunately don't. SARS and MERS are the predecessors to COVID-19 or COVID for brevity, so I'm going to refer to it as COVID now. Like the other coronavirus strains, COVID attacks the lungs and results in shortness of breath, dry cough, fever, and extreme cases, pneumonia. It is more infectious, though less lethal than SARS or MERS, which is reflected in the exponentially rising caseload all over the world, hence the concern about it. There are many asymptomatic cases who nonetheless spread the infection unwittingly. You know, that's why the numbers are rising so sharply for COVID. Elderly people are disproportionately affected by severe symptoms and death, while no children below the age of 10 have died from COVID. Though, again, you know, they might be uh, spreading it unwittingly. It began in the wet markets of Wuhan with infected bats or infected pangolins, transmitting the disease to local buyers who consumed those wild animals. Human infection likely occurred in the third week of November, which was reported in a Wuhan newspaper on November 17, 2019. Community spread, which is human-to-human interaction, transmission, in Wuhan, began to happen throughout the period, making Wuhan the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic. In the early stage of the disease, the Wuhan authorities ignored the warning of doctors about the community spread and actively silenced and censored them on social media. But as infections and number of deaths spiked and the hospitals began to be overwhelmed, Chinese netizens began to share stories of the disease and their experiences in the overwhelmed medical facilities, resulting in a massive panic and confusion. In contrast, during SARS, there was no social media or widespread internet use, so there has been this one important change in communication channels. In January 17, the Wuhan authorities reassured residents that Luna. New Year's celebrations could continue to be held, 
which drastically increased infections, which should remind us of uh, what happened um, with the Spanish flu in Philadelphia. On January 20th, the pandemic became so large that the Beijing authorities stepped in and then declared a lockdown on Wuhan on January 23rd, which was extended to the whole province a day later. So it was containment from then on. Initial government incompetence and online censorship allowed the situation to fester in the initial period. What happened since then, however, is also equally amazing. Once the Chinese authorities identified the problem, they introduced an effective lockdown, setting up checkpoints everywhere in Hubei to not allow people to move around, hence containing the spread to other provinces. So if you look at caseloads in large cities like in Beijing or in Shanghai, it's much uh, you know, lower than in Wuhan. Uh, all lunar celebrations and travel options across the country were also cancelled or interrupted. Um, they also created makeshift hospitals um, that were set up within a few days to cope with the growing healthcare demands, which most under other countries would have struggled with and are indeed struggling with. If you look at the cases in, uh, in, in Iran and Italy, I'm going to talk about that in a bit. Uh, by the end of February, China brought a disease under control by reducing the daily increase in COVID infections, which already is, an indi is a positive indication uh, for controlling the cases. And it's so far the only country to do so. Um, well, in, in South Korea, we, now we see a flattening of the curve, and maybe it's going to come down very, very soon. Uh, while everywhere else in the world we are seeing an exponential rise in cases, uh, so it is very much a global pandemic, so it remains an open question whether the cases will spike substantially if public life returns to normal. And that's, that's one of the uncertainties that a lot of public health officials are concerned about. In the last week of January, first cases became reported in other parts of the world, primarily in countries that service many flights uh, to China, you know, East Asia, Western Europe, and North America. Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong are noteworthy cases of effective containment given the trauma and experience of SARS, which is very, very important here. Effective and determined authorities can contain the spread of the virus. Singapore suspended all flights from Wuhan, early on and tracks down every suspected case of a COVID patient and tests your immediate social contacts as well, which is uh, called contact tracing, a method that they sort of have perfected and I think a lot of other uh, public health authorities are struggling with that. The government encourages people to get tested for the virus and does not charge them for it. It offers self-employed people 100 Singapore dollars a day and employers are prohibited from deducting annual leave from staff who take off from work. Singapore's leader, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long, has been very forthright in communicating with the public, which prevented hamster buying in stores, which I think we see in other places now, which is not good. Taiwan and Hong Kong similarly banned travel from the mainland. Um, Hong Kong also cancelled schools and any public gatherings. Given the traumatic experience of SARS 17 years ago, I mean, recall the, the hundreds of case for, um, cases in, in Hong Kong, many people are compliant with the government request uh, for the lockdown. So in other parts of the world, the public health response has been weaker, which shouldn't surprise us too much because they haven't been exposed to the severity of, uh, of this pandemic in the recent past. South Korea, Iran, Italy, and now Spain have become the new epicenters of COVID-19, uh, though, I mean, it's definitely going to spread to uh, all, all other parts in the world. South Korea was barely impacted by SARS, but it has effective public health authorities, which resulted in substantial testing capabilities being rolled out uh, in response to COVID. 
It tested 10,000 people per day and imposed self-isolation on patients testing positive while also aggressively using disinfectants. Therefore, the number of new infections are now receding. Uh, Japan uh, had a pathetic response with more than 1,000 detected infections uh, you know, and st- had been struggling to handle the Diamond Princess cruise ship with uh, 700 infections. It's a big mistake to let uh, you know passengers and ships uh, remain there because you know the ventilation is going to sort of distribute the disease to everybody. Basically, um, they were holed up in the port of Yokohama and were not allowed to disembark the ship as the authorities feared spread. Uh, and now, now they actually left. Uh, many of them left that cruise ship. Iran's cases began to spike since the end of February, and the regime had refused to close businesses and mosques um, and did not impose a quarantine, fearing even more unrest due to economic hardship. So they had uh, previous bouts of protest, which I talked about in the earlier podcast, which you can check out. You know, hardship is already quite severe with the reimposition of U.S. sanctions uh, that occurred in 2018, With oil prices collapsing as a result of the global economic slowdown, the regime faces cash shortages, which forced it to go to the IMF to apply for a $5 billion loan. The short-term focus on preserving economic activity does not even help the economy either because hospitalization deaths mount. So, you know, what is your economy if not your people, uh, you know, who should be healthy and, you know, go about their daily lives? and you're directly endangering it. In Europe, the new epicenter became northern Italy's Lombardy region. The death toll mounted as the Italian authorities gravely underestimated the severity of the pandemic. It did not do a lockdown until the second week of March, I believe it was like last last week or so, um, when the first cases cropped up um, back in January. So they had over a month of time of response. As of March 14, Italy has over 21,000 confirmed cases and 1,400 deaths, which is aggravated by the fact that so many Italians are old age and therefore more susceptible to uh, die from the disease. The lockdown and associated social isolation is quite unusual for Italian culture, uh, which is very affectionate and it's captured in the following statement that I Um, quoted from the New York Times. Uh, When people have appeared, they have given one another a wide berth. So un-Italian. Normally, people charge into each other and greet with affection, shaking hands, kissing and embracing. Italy is a touchy-feely society. We tend to trust our senses and intuition more than grand ideas, which are supposedly German trademarks, For us, life is food, wine, music, arts, design, landscape, the smell of the countryside, the warmth of one's family, and the embrace of friends. Those involve our mouths, our noses, our ears, our eyes, our hands, and fear of COVID-19 forces us to repudiate those senses. It is painful. At this point, we are facing a global pandemic. Countries that believe that they can ride this out are badly mistaken. All humans in the world have no acquired immunity for COVID, and given the power of the community spread, um, you know, when not doing the lockdown, social distancing, um, which means cancelling all mass events and minimizing human contact, and aggressive testing and treatment will result in a huge jump in the death toll. Surely the social costs of the virus are huge as humans are social animals. And I should understand it better than most people as a sociologist. Yet, you know, we are told to reduce social interactions uh, that are face-to-face. For the small minority of people who are adept hermits, you know, such as, you know, PhD students in dissertation stage, looking at myself here, uh, life may not change that much. But for most of the rest of society, the COVID pandemic will be very disruptive. 
one of the few silver linings is that an enforced hermit lifestyle can result in more contemplation and taking more lightly, taking things more lightly. Um, you know, if you had all your worries about, um, you know, success and working hard, etc., and that could result in longer-term social changes that we cannot anticipate yet. You know, having being less work focused and more on contemplation. Well, I'm going to talk about the negative economic consequences in just a bit. To allow the health systems to cope with the patient intake, the spread of the disease has to be extended for as long as possible, which is the meaning of flattening the curve. You know, just Google flattening the curve and uh, it will give you nice illustrations. Flattening the curve does not necessarily mean that the vi virus will effectively be you know, abolished or gotten rid of, contained. Um, we are in the mitigation stage now, and that assumes the need for herd immunity. So, the, But the, this is still quite controversial, and I'll break it down in a bit. So herd immunity assumes that 60% of the population must be exposed to the disease, and acquire immunity to make further spread to the rest of the population unlikely. So that would be the worst of the worst scenario where you know you you go to its uh, the herd immunity through natural means. On the other hand, if as in the case of China, the exposure can be limited because of these quarantine measures, then the herd immunity might not be required to root out. COVID-19, which is the path that we should be taking first of all. Containment, if feasible, is the preferred route as it would lower the death toll, although it is difficult because, you know, once life returns back to normal, it only takes one infectious person, you know, a small patch of people to repeat the ordeal and then we'd have to go back to a longer lockdown. So, uh, so we'll have to think about that. Um, on the other hand, yeah, we flatten the curve. We have fewer total cases at any given point, right? So that the health systems uh, can manage it. You know, in some places like in Iran or in, in Italy, the health authorities are completely um, devastated and um, overwhelmed by the you know by the sheer number of cases. So containment absolutely must be the first priority. But you know, only very few leaders are now openly admitting about you know uh, going to its herd immunity as a possible solution. Angela Merkel hinted at it, uh, and also Boris Johnson in the UK. But in the case of the British Prime Minister, I think he made it sound like it was not necessary to cancel public events, fearing that if you cancel it now, uh, it would undermine legitimacy. People would, you know, be groaning and complaining about it now, and they wouldn't want to uh, obey such a current quarantine order uh, at a later stage. That's the reasoning of the of the UK government. And it makes it sound like they desire to reach the peak disease as soon as possible so that we can go back to business as usual. But the collateral damage of tens of thousands of excess deaths is quite a steep price to pay, and I think it must be avoided by all means. It's irresponsible for a leader to say such a thing, that you know we, we, we get herd immunity through natural means. To be fair, the UK government wants to spread out the period of the disease, so the time that it takes, by telling older and sicker populations to avoid leaving the house, and that could, of course, by itself, keep the uh, fatality down. But on the other hand, letting the adult non-elderly population be exposed to the disease unnecessarily is also irresponsible, because, you know, among young, healthy individuals, you know, death rate is, is, is much less, but it's not zero, it's like 0.2% or something. So, in addition, the medical advice that infected patients with symptoms should stay home for seven days, but the UK government demands, 
is inadequate because inf the infectious period and the incubation period can be much longer than that. I mean, you can have incubation of up to uh, uh, two weeks. And, you know, once those, you know, um, infect cases, um, you know, go back to the public, they're going to infect uh, many others uh, with the disease. Uh, and still endanger the weaker populations. Allowing public life to continue uninterrupted will spike caseload and death toll, which will overwhelm the health service and generate social panic. So they say, well, I'm concerned about undermining public legitimacy if I shut down now, but it's going to be undermined even more if you don't do the shutdown. What I suspect the British government will change tack and impose the lockdown in the near future, but will have a sharper rise in infections and death than if they acted immediately. The most gentle and only ethically defensible way to attain herd immunity, and, the, and go back to this concept because it's, I think it's still very crucial, is by developing and dispensing a vaccine, though that will take years to develop, I mean, at least at least one year. I mean, with all you know, the trial that's that's happening now, and we haven't had a good track record with getting a vaccine for the previous um, versions of the coronavirus, SARS and MERS, um, perhaps because you know it was much easier contained. In the U.S., the Trump administration's incompetence is finally proving fatal. First, he downplayed the severity of the crisis, promising people that the few existing cases can be reduced to zero. As the crisis is escalating, he now denies testing kits because he fears high numbers would lower his re-election chances. This is the most stupid response one can have about the pandemic. By keeping the public ignorant about the symptoms, the number of cases will skyrocket as not enough infected people self quarantine. The next step of the administration's PR effort will be to deny the escalating death toll as fake news. Trump is directly contradicting his public health officials, exhibiting his ignorance and impotence to handle the crisis. This honest leadership results in chaos and confusion in the public. States and municipalities are left on their own to figure out how to get ventilators, testing kits or hand sanitizers. Though, you know, this could be changing as I speak because, you know, there's a lot of dynamic decisions being made at the moment. For a rich country, the U.S. is unusually poorly prepared because of the lack of family medical leave policy and a privatized for-profit healthcare system. Presently, people who want to be tested have to pay thousands of dollars and treatment could cost tens of thousands of dollars. Now, this is not going to apply to everybody, but... Um, you know, if if these old rules of the game are still in place, is, um, this is what it's going to be. Pharma companies want to profit from the crisis by charging a lot for the vaccine when it comes out, uh, and the, and Trump basically himself says, "Well, I can't guarantee that uh, it's going to be affordable to everybody." This will deter treatment and can exacerbate the pandemic as untreated patients continue showing up to work and infecting and killing more people. As the stock markets are tanking, the Fed has pumped half a trillion dollars to support big banks and large corporations, while the Trump administration is still carrying out cuts in the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, uh, funding. The CDC is needed more than ever to find a cure to COVID and also to keep the public informed about what's happening. The wrong priorities of the government will exacerbate the effects of the pandemic. So what we need is a complete lockdown of public life. I think that's been pointed out uh, now, and I think uh, it's also echoed now very widely. And in part, this has already happened. As people are traveling less, restaurants and shops are less visited, and public events and conferences are canceled, Many businesses like airlines or caterers are laying off workers. Those privileged enough to shift to teleworking will do so. And my institution in higher education does that. Uh, but that is not feasible in all jobs, especially not in the 
vital law school service sector, which is actually is needed to sustain us, like food, uh, some some in the hospitality sector, retail, transportation, warehousing, and delivery. The unemployment rate will rise and social suffering can increase as most people don't have any economic savings. Trump's response is to temporarily cut the payroll tax, which won't amount to much money because shift cutbacks could be much more um, would be much more and compensate the small income gains of the payroll tax cut. And it won't help people who become unemployed. The government has six months of unemployment insurance. Although if it takes longer for life to get back to normal, the expiration of unemployment insurance would be devastating. Reasonable politicians like Bernie Sanders are calling for an expansion of unemployment and paid sick leave. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Tulsi Gabbard demand a universal basic income, which would be the ideal policy. I'm even more worried about the pandemic's impact on less developed countries that lack proper medical facilities. Surely the more youthful populations might make them more resistant than the aging, uh, rapidly aging Italian population. On the other hand, given that malnourishment is not solved in all less developed countries, physically weaker individuals could be more prone to develop severe cases from COVID, which, uh, while public safety and law enforcement are incapable of sufficiently enforcing social distancing once those um, policies get implemented. The negative economic ramifications of COVID are quite severe, although the implications for the environment are quite positive as less transportation and consumption reduces CO2 emissions. The air quality in China is notably improved with the travel restrictions and lockdown. You, those are measures that you couldn't do just in, until a few months ago. Humans have long had major influence on the environment, but it has taken a pandemic to reduce that influence. Recall that the Black Plague in the 14th century led to reforestation and a cooler climate for a while. While public health authorities are overwhelmed by the patient load and scientists are frantically developing a vaccine, public discourse is completely confused over COVID. Unlike previous pandemics, we live in a world of social media where communication is instantaneous. So we have seen the avalanche when it began in Wuhan and radiated to other parts of the world. So we could have taken a lot of measures uh, in the time period, but yeah, many authorities um, were waiting. People can Google information uh, on the virus and how it spreads and take measures to delay the spread. The unfortunate reality, however, is that the vast majority of people are neither scientists nor do they have a scientific mindset. Uh, and that, of course, is, is, is a big issue. You know, Rumors can easily spread, which are silly at best and dangerous at worst. President Trump's anti-science mindset is likely in... in the latter category and the dangerous category, and I suggest you Google his statements to make you, yourself a picture of it. In the early days of COVID coverage in January, racist attacks against Asians ticked upward as other racial groups believed that any Asian must be the carrier of the virus even if they hadn't been to China in the recent past and even as the disease began to spread across the world and affecting all races of people. Surely there has been a problem with the wet markets in Wuhan and the sale of wild animals must be banned, although on the other hand, the presence of avian and swine flu suggests that even frequently consumed domesticated animals can transmit diseases to humans and can have you know, certain mutations that are adverse to humans. Within Chinese-speaking uh, networks and right-wing U.S. networks, there are you know, hopefully just short Term rumors now about the U.S. having deliberately spread the virus uh, in China. The origin of the rumor is a Chinese foreign ministry spokesman, Li Jianzhao. This is evidently combative Cold War rhetoric, which has no basis in reality, but is meant to inflame tensions between the two major economic powers in the world. You recall that there's been this active trade war between U.S. and China for the last two years. Public ignorance about the crisis can exacerbate 
the crisis, and the way to deal with it is to have strong political leadership, right? Even in the, in in, this, in the period of social media, especially in the period of social media, we need to have strong leaders, where politicians and scientific advisors continuously communicate to the public and assuage irrational fears. Although it is not obvious whether we will be able to observe this level of leadership in all cases, in the U.S. case, we have an evident lack of leadership at the very top. Whether it is the plague, the flu, or the coronavirus, diseases have always been with us. While we do not cause the diseases directly, human decisions matter in how severe the disease is, and improved science can help us mitigate those diseases which has been the case with the plague and also HIV, which um, you know we have not cured at this point, but we have very effective antiretroviral uh, drugs that can uh, allow HIV patients to have a close to normal life. Um, you know, and even as we develop the medicine, there's a likelihood of drug resistance, and then we have to find new drugs. So it's an endless game uh, that's played with nature. But the irony is that it is also scientific advances that have also made us susceptible to these global pandemics. So by becoming first an agricultural and then an industrial society, we have increased our population size substantially. And what that means is we've got increasing urban densities, which increases the risk of spreading the disease. And so we also have globalization, right? So we have information, communication technology, but also airplanes and stuff. And, you know, and, and lastly, we also, you know, interact with animals, either domesticated or wild, and we're getting, um, maybe getting our required calories, but also expose ourselves uh, to disease. Thus, what is at the heart in the COVID pandemic and other past pandemics is that we humans are at war with nature, it's a sad reality, and it is a war in which our species is inferior to, and I'm going to explain that why. Fundamentally, human life is only possible as being part of nature, you know, having the right amount of oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere, having access to fossil fuels and other raw materials that shape our material lives, having enough drinking water, and so forth. Huh? The reverse dependence is at best tenuous, Planet Earth would be no worse off without humans, assuming that it has any feelings, which maybe not. In fact, not having humans around would perhaps be better for other animal species you know, whose habitats don't get destroyed by human settlements and climate change. You know, both increasing problems. And now we are being hit by a pandemic and the adaptability of diseases means that we can see a more benign or a more malign mutation of the disease, which will put an unbearable stress in the healthcare system and result in the loss of many people's lives. The severity of climate change means that even if pandemics remain temporary inconveniences, climate change is um, here with us and making more lives a living hell. And even as the survival as a species is uncertain, the fundamental reality is that for us as individuals, life is limited. So even when all's said and done, you know, we come from dust and we shall return there, as the famous saying goes, whether it be from COVID, flu, heart attack, accident, cancer, or infirmity at old age. Um, and I just recently finished reading a book by uh, Albert Camus. He was a, a f French philosopher, existentialist in the mid 20th century. Uh, and so he recounts the myth of Sisyphus. Um, you know, if you don't recall that story, it's about, um, you know, Sisyphus having stolen stuff from the gods uh, and he's getting punished. By having to, uh, you know, roll up uh, a stone up the hill and repeat that ordeal all the time, uh, and you know, the comparison to our lives is that well, we're all kind of Sisyphus because 
you know, we, you know, we have to accept the fact that we, you know, whatever we're doing, we're rolling up, uh, rolling the rock up the hill, uh, and we have to recognize that it's completely pointless, but we still have to do it. Uh, that's, that's a pretty tough lesson. But so being aware of our mortality gives added emphasis to the slogan Carpe Diem. The silver lining is that COVID focuses the human mind, as I said. This is a global pandemic. Everybody has their eyes on it. You know, people up on social media, people you know, like myself now talking about it for an hour, uh, people in newspapers, I mean, every single headline. The government's going to talk about it. We have a common enemy. And in the coming days and weeks ahead, we have to practice social distancing even as we have to care for each other. And I think that's the most important message. Thank you very much for listening in to this uh, podcast. Uh, you know, and I, I, I wish you um, all the best. And uh, if, you, uh, if you are sick, I wish you the best of recovery. And uh, these are tough times, but uh, we're going to make it through. Uh, so thank you very much and um, hope to see you next time.